Welcome everyone to another episode of our podcast series. We're so glad to have you with us as we continue studying some of the most important things that have been left for us in these last days of Earth's history. Before we get into the subject for today, I just have a uh, an announcement to make with respect to the continuation of the podcast series. We are going to be, in fact, changing the name from Berean Talk to Remnant Talk. And the purpose behind the name change is twofold. First and foremost, uh, the majority of subjects that are discussed on this series are specifically related to uh, issues within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And we felt it, that it's more fitting to have that name transition from Berean Talk to Remnant Talk because we're going to be specifically talking about some of the most important things related to the movement that God started in these last days in order to finish the work. Now, with that thought in mind, however, we are also going to be continuing Berean Talk uh, as its own platform. It's going to be transitioning to its own YouTube channel. And on that series, uh, we're going to now go forward with two separate series, Remnant Talk, which will continue here on the 7-Day Press YouTube channel, and then a separate Berean Talk podcast format, which is going to be on a different channel, its own channel. And the subjects that are going to be discussed there are going to be related to various themes within Christianity as a whole. And it's going to be used more of an evangelistic tool to arrest the attention of people that are not familiar with the Seventh-day Adventist message. So this is the reason why going forward, you're going to see a name change here on this podcast. And as well, as soon as the new platform, the new YouTube channel is running, we're going to make sure to let you know so you can follow along the various discussions that are going to be taking place there as well. Now, with all of this out of the way, we're going to now move to the subject that we have for today. And what we're going to be discussing today is related actually to a message that was preached probably about half a year ago by a pastor by the name of David Gates. Perhaps many of you are familiar with him. He has become fairly involved in mission work, specifically in Central and South America. And during that presentation that he had about half a year ago, he brought out something very important, something very interesting that every single Seventh-day Adventist should be examining for themselves. And our desire here today is to encourage not only him, but all Seventh-day Adventists to pay attention to what was mentioned there. So we are going to have now a short segment from that presentation just to give you an idea of where the discussion for today is headed. And we're going to come back and begin to look at the subject and actually look at it from a slightly different perspective that he brings out right away, but then connect everything together at the end. So here is the piece of information that he shared during that message that he preached six months ago. Let's look at some authorities from our church and what they say about the, our past history. From William Johnson, the editor of the Adventist Review. The beliefs of the Adventists have changed over the years under the influence of the present truth. For example, that the Son came from the Father sometime before creation. In the same way, the dogma of the Trinity that now forms part of our fundamental beliefs was not maintained by Adventist pioneers. So here we have Pastor Johnson, Entonces, aquí tenemos al Pastor Johnson, the editor of our world official publication. El editor de nuestra publicación eh, mundial oficial. Recognizing that we have changed over the years, some of the changes have come through present truth and are positive. Eh, reconociendo que ha habido cambios a lo largo de los años, que algunos de estos cambios ha venido de manera positiva a través de verdad presente. But he also admits that the Trinity was a doctrine that was not held by any of our pioneers, and it is now part of our Adventist beliefs. Pero también menciona que la Trinidad no formaba parte de lo que nuestros pioneros creían y que ahora sí. So the church we have today is not the same as it was 20, 30 years ago. Así que la iglesia que tenemos hoy día no es la misma que teníamos hace unos 20 o 30 años atrás. Or 100 atrás. years ago. O 100 años atrás. Let's look at what, what Dr. George Knight has to say. He's professor of church history, or he was professor of church history in Andrews University. Y vamos a ver lo que tiene que decir también George Knight, que es profesor, era profesor emérito de Andrews University 
en historia de la iglesia. The majority of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventism would not be able to join the church today. La mayoría de los fundadores del Adventismo del séptimo día no podrían unirse a la iglesia hoy día. If they had to support the fundamental beliefs of the denomination as they are today. Si tuvieran que suscribirse a las creencias fundamentales de la denominación. Especially the majority would not be in support of belief number uh, I have a misspelling there. Belief number two, the doctrine of the Trinity. Específicamente, la mayoría no estarían de acuerdo mm. con la creencia número dos, el de la doctrina de la Trinidad. Interesting. Interesante. All those pioneers that we appreciate and honor. Todos aquellos pioneros que nosotros honramos, apreciamos. It is recognized that most of them could not be part of the church today. Se reconoce que la mayoría de ellos no pudieran ser parte de la iglesia hoy. So what kind of Adventists are we? Así que, ¿qué tipo de Adventistas somos? Are we Adventists that believe like our founding fathers or are we modern generation, postmodern Adventists? O eh, somos Adventistas que creemos lo que nuestros padres fundadores creyeron o somos adventistas postmodernistas. Now we recognize that the church has grown in understanding of truth. We know that. Ahora, nosotros reconocemos que la iglesia ha crecido en cuanto al entendimiento de verdad. We know that God led our early founders into an understanding of prophecy, the health message. Nosotros reconocemos que Dios guió a los pioneros a un entendimiento de profecía, del mensaje pro salud. But we're not talking about the early learning period, we're talking about when they passed away as mature Adventists, they would not be able to be members today. Pero no estamos hablando de ese periodo inicial de la iglesia. Estamos hablando ya de hombres que maduros en la fe ya no pudieran ser parte de la iglesia hoy. So when Ellen G. White today would have a problem being part of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Por ejemplo, Elena de White tuviera problema hoy de ser miembro de la iglesia. It is time to wake up. Es tiempo de despertar. As you can see from what he just mentioned in his message, David Gates brought out a very important fact. And today, in this Berean Talk discussion, or should I say in this Remnant Talk discussion, we are to specifically... Uh, we are going to be specifically dealing with facts. Oftentimes, when a subject is discussed, there's always this um, level of uh, people being subjective to their own opinion, to what they think is right. But today, our focus will be primarily on dealing with facts in order to make everything as objective as possible. And what uh, David Gates mentioned, and what David Gates mentioned was that over the years, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has gone through a change when it comes to its fundamental principles or fundamental beliefs. And he pointed out one uh, very particular change that has taken place in those fundamental beliefs. But before we get to that very particular change that he brought out, we're going to actually start way back uh, and examine certain points that are presented in the Bible that are connected to actually the work of the Reformation and the actual creation of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're then going to look at the fundamental principles during the time of Ellen White and the pioneers, what God had to say about those principles, and ultimately bring everything and connect it with the specific point and the specific principle that he mentioned in his sermon. So in order to begin today, we're actually going to be opening our Bibles now to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 1 through the 5, we see that Paul, all the way back in the beginning of the Christian era, gives us a warning and gives us information with respect to certain things that are going to transpire in the church. So starting at verse 1, he says, Now, we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, 
except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Here in those verses, Paul is specifically talking with respect to a falling away that needs to come before the second coming of Jesus Christ. But not only that, the key that we want to focus on within the words that uh, he has presented here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is the fact that not only is there going to be a falling away, but also he brings out a specific figure called the man of sin. And he talks about this figure, presents this figure, and tells us that there will come a time when the man of sin is going to be revealed. That the works of this figure are not going to remain hidden. They're going to be revealed. And who are they going to be revealed? Well, they're going to be revealed by God's true people. Most of us are fairly familiar with these verses and very well know who these verses are talking about. We have here a representation of a system, a system that indeed perverted Christianity and brought to fruition this falling away. We have become familiar with the fact that this system has become known as the Roman Catholic system. And in fact, this is not something uh, uh, specifically related to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. This is something that was well understood by most of the Reformers. The purpose of the Reformation that started in the 1500s was for this initial revealing of this system. This is why Martin Luther and many other individuals have uh, gone on and participated in what has become known as the Protestant Reformation. In fact, if we are to look at a secular source of information, going to history.com, we're going to see that um, historians themselves have realized that the purpose of the Reformation, in fact, lines up with what we see here Paul presenting to us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Here's a little bit of a paragraph that is found on the history.com website. And in this uh, segment that deals with the Reformation, we read that historians usually date the start of the Protestant Reformation to the 1517 publication of Martin Luther's 95 Thesis. Now they go on and then they give us what was in fact the purpose of that reformation. What was the purpose? Why was there a need for a reformation to begin with? And how is that related to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? Well, in this secular source, we read that the key ideas of the reformation were to call, were a call to purify the church and bring out the belief that the Bible and not tradition should be the sole source of spiritual authority. Going back in time and, and studying prophecy and confirming everything through history, we see that as the Christian era began, little by little, there was this falling away that was being introduced within Christianity. And this falling away was exemplified through tradition, through various ideas, thoughts, and principles that were no longer based on the Bible. This is, one, this is why one of the primary thoughts behind the Reformation is sola scriptura. People were calling Christians to come back to the Word of God. They realized that there has been this falling away. And starting with Martin Luther and many other individuals who follow suit, we see that this information that is given to us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 was something that these reformers very well understood. Martin Luther knew who the man of sin was. Martin Luther had come to understand that there was a falling away because Martin Luther was being led by God. In fact, he says openly, for who is the man of sin and the son of perdition, but he who by his teaching and his ordinances increases the sin and perdition of souls in the church, while he yet sits in the church as if he were God. All these conditions have now for many ages been fulfilled by the papal tyranny. 
And it wasn't just Luther who had come to understand this. John Calvin has something similar to say. We read, Though it be admitted that Rome was once the mother of all churches, yet from the time when it began to be the seat of Antichrist, it has ceased to be what it was before. Some persons think us too severe and censorious when we call the Roman pontiff Antichrist. But those who are of this opinion do not consider that they bring the same charge of presumption against Paul himself, after whom we speak and whose language we adopt. John Calvin, just as Martin Luther and the rest of the reformers understood 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It is during this period of the Reformation that we see the beginning of this revealing of the man of sin. Looking at history, looking at Bible prophecy, we know that there was a period of continual persecution as a result of this. We know that many people gave their lives for the purpose of bringing the Word of God back to the people, for the purpose of eliminating tradition and opposing this system that has become known as the man of sin, the papacy, the Roman pontiff, whose system was bringing error, whose system was, uh, in fact, even physically trying to remove the Bible from the hands of believers. As the Reformation continued, we know that various denominations were being formed and these denominations were trying to come back the truth not only were they trying to come back the truth but just to stay within the theme of second thessalonians chapter 2 they were fighting against the papal system that was the purpose behind these new denominations being formed people were being called out of an apostate institution in the hopes of coming back to sola scriptura, to coming back to the Bible. In fact, in the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith, we see that one of the main purposes and principles behind the establishment of this church was to indeed reveal the man of sin. This is why they mentioned that the Lord Jesus Christ is the head of the church in whom by the appointment of the Father, all power for the calling institution order or government of the church is invested in a supreme and sovereign manner neither can the pope of rome in any sense be head thereof but is that antichrist that that man of sin and son of perdition that exalted himself in the church against christ we see here a direct reference to the verses that we just read in second thessalonians chapter 2 protestants set out to fulfill this verse to reveal the man of sin to other Christians and call Christians out of the errors that the papal institution has created. And this brings us back now to the time, again, as, as it was mentioned, to the time of Ellen White and the pioneers and the formation of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Why did God have to go and inspire people to create now a new denomination after all these various movements were already created within Protestantism? Couldn't God just finish the work with the Lutheran or the Baptist church? Why was there a need for a new denomination to be established? And in order to find the answer to this, we're actually going to resort to a statement that James White himself had mentioned. In the Review and Herald of February 7th, 1856, James White pens the following words. He says, The greatest fault we can find in the Reformation is the Reformers stopped reforming. Had they gone on and onward till they had left the last vestige of papacy behind, and he lists a few of those errors that were found in the papal system, such as natural immortality, sprinkling, the Trinity, and Sunday keeping, the church would now be free from her unscriptural errors. So here, James White answers the question that we have asked. He tells us that God had to come and inspire a new group of people that Revelation chapter 12 presents as the remnant to come on the scenes of this world so that the work that Paul talks about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, so that this revealing of the man of sin can indeed be completed. The man of sin could not have been revealed completely unless people had let go of all the vestige 
that is found in the papacy. All the vestige of the papacy. God needed people who would indeed sit on the Bible and the Bible alone on a platform of truth so that the work can be completed and so that we can see the ultimate fulfillment of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. In order for the papacy to be fully revealed, that man of sin and, and why he is the man of sin, a group of people that had completely separated from the errors that originated from Rome needed to be established. And this is how the Seventh-day Adventist Church is established. This church is now started by God himself, inspired by God himself, and he brings this church to a position of biblical truth. In fact, to be solidified in this as a Seventh-day Adventist, let us go back to that time, to these early years, and let's look at some of the statements that Ellen White herself has given us with respect to the formation of that church and how biblically sound this church was. We're going to start with this first statement where she says, We are to be established in the faith, in the light of the truth given us in our early experience. At that time, one heir after another pressed in upon us. Ministers and doctors brought in new doctrines. We would search the scriptures with much prayer, and the Holy Spirit would bring the truth to our minds. Sometimes whole nights would be devoted to searching the scriptures and earnestly asking God for guidance. Companies of devoted men and women assembled for this purpose. The power of God would come upon me, and I was enabled clearly to define what is truth and what is error. As the points of our faith were thus established, our feet were placed upon a solid foundation. We accepted the truth point by point under the demonstration of the Holy Spirit. I would be taken off in vision and explanations of heavenly things and of the sanctuary so that we were placed where light was shining on us in clear, distinct rays. In these paragraphs, Ellen White takes us back to that time, to the formation of this movement known as the Seventh-day Adventist movement, and she tells us that God was there present with all the men and women that were being assembled together. Not only that, but God was leading them point by point so that they can be set on a sure, sound, biblical foundation. She's pointing us back to that early experience. It was then, it was within the first few decades that God gave the truth to that movement. And as we continue reading now through various paragraphs that she has left for us, we are going to be completely solidified and given the picture as to what this truth consisted of. In this next statement, she says, As a people, we are to stand firm on the platform of eternal truth that has withstood test and trial. We are to hold to the sure pillars of our faith. Now she's making things more definitive. She is going to tell us what these pillars of our faith are to be. And she also calls them, mark this, eternal truth. She says, the principles of truth that God has revealed to us are only true foundation. And here's another important key. She says, they, these principles of truth, that God has revealed to them, to the people that were present back then, they have made us what we are. Well, what were they? Seventh-day Adventists. It's extremely important for us to understand here that Ellen White is giving us a definition of Seventh-day Adventism. What is Seventh-day Adventism? Well, Seventh-day Adventism is a movement that is placed upon eternal truth, and this eternal truth is found within the principles of truth that God revealed to the people who are starting that movement. She says, they made us what we are. They make us Seventh-day Ad Adventists. And now she goes on and says something just as important. The lapse of time has not lessened their value. It is the constant effort of the enemy to remove these truths from their setting and put in their place spurious theories. He will bring in everything that he possibly can to carry out his deceptive designs. But the Lord will raise up men of keen perception who will give these truths their proper place in the plan of God. God. As we carry on now into the next statement, we're going to see how things become 
clearer and clearer. And you will see how all of these things that we are examining now are not only going to be connected with what we started with 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, but also with the information that David Gates was sharing. And we're going to see how if we want to be Seventh-day Adventists by definition, and not only by name, carrying a name upon our backs, God is so much more interested in the definition of what Seventh-day Adventism is. We're going to see how these things that were have been brought out especially in the past several years, are extremely important because they're going to actually prepare a people to stand true to God and come and bring to fruition what we read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that complete revealing of the man of sin. In this next statement in letter 232 that was penned in the year 1903, Ellen White says, let not erroneous theories receive countenance from the people who ought to be standing firm on the platform of eternal truth. This is exactly what we've been discussing. We've been talking about this platform of eternal truth. And what is this platform of eternal truth? She defines it so clearly that none of us need to err. She says God calls upon us, so upon everybody who considers themselves a Seventh-day Adventist, God calls upon us to hold firmly to the fundamental principles that are based upon unquestionable authority. So what makes us Seventh-day Adventists, connecting all the statements that we read? Well, we are Seventh-day Adventists when we hold on with the grip of faith to the fundamental principles that God himself, through the guidance of his Holy Spirit, help the people that formed this movement to stand upon. She calls them eternal truth, not temporary truth, not half a truth, not, not a piece of information that we still need to develop. She says, this is our foundation. This is what we, who consider ourselves Seventh-day Adventists, need to stand upon, our fundamental principles. And why is that important in light of what we read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? Because... Brothers and sisters, as we saw in those verses, the man of sin needs to be revealed. The man of sin needs to be revealed to this world completely. The Protestant Reformation was only the beginning of that revelation, but it was not complete and it couldn't be complete because neither the Lutheran Church nor the Methodist Church nor the Baptist Church or any other movement that was started and that is part of that Protestant Reformation was standing on an eternal, on a foundation that was based on nothing but the truth. Hence why comes the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You see that this church has been given a purpose. It has a purpose. It needs to fulfill 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And Ellen White has made it clear that if we want to be part of that, we have to, the only way we can do it is if we set our feet on a sure foundation. Now, talking about the purpose of the church, I think that if we open uh, our Bibles and specifically when we go into the book of Revelation and when we examine certain of things, if I were to ask, would you tell me what the purpose of the Seventh-day Adventist church is? I think many of us will instantly point to Revelation chapter 14, and rightfully so. In fact, Ellen White herself says in Manuscript 32 of 1896 that the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's messages has been located by the word of inspiration. And she says that no peg or pin is to be removed from these three messages. I'm bringing now the three angel's messages, which have become known as, as, as the main reason as to why God brings out a group of people. They are the main purpose behind that remnant. They are to preach these messages. And we're going to tie now the three angels' messages, the fact that no peg or pin is to be removed from them, to what we started with, 2 Thessalonians. That's, we're, we're really s staying within the realm of what Paul warned us about because everything here is connected to those verses in 2 Thessalonians. Let me ask you the following question. What is the third angel's message about? What does it deal with? Isn't the third angel's message dealing with 
the very system that Paul talked about in 2 Thessalonians isn't the beast power, that same antichrist power, that same man of sin. What is the biggest conflict at the end of time? In fact, why was this phrase or that title, man of sin, given to the Roman Catholic system? It was given because that system substituted the law of God with the traditions of men. The title man of sin points us to the fact that the papacy changed the definition of sin. And it changed the definition of sin by changing the law of God. And once you change the definition of sin and the law of God, and once you make that which is righteous sin and that which is unrighteous righteousness, you're automatically in the business of creating sinners. And this is what the papacy does. The goal of the papacy is to create sinners. And this is one of the main reasons as to why this title has been given to this system. Not only that, but this is the culmination of everything at the end of time. This deals with the proclamation of the third angel's message. The most important message to be given at the end of time deals with the revelation of the man of sin. It points to the mark of the beast crisis. It points to the fact that this institution changed the Sabbath of the Lord for Sunday observance, that it substituted the word of God for the teachings of man. This is the most important thing for Adventists to do. It is essentially the work that they have been called to finish. The goal and purpose of the Seventh-day Adventist movement is to expose the men of sin to the world and to bring people to a knowledge of the truth and to righteousness. We cannot attain to righteousness unless the truth has been given to us. It is only through the truth that we are sanctified. It is only through understanding who the man of sin is that one will be able to see the changes that have taken place to the law of God. And it is only through this knowledge of the truth and sharing that through the preaching of the first, second, and specifically third angel's messages that we are going to see the fulfillment of Second Thessalonians chapter 2. And I keep on bringing this out because it is intimately connected to the discussion that we want to go over today. Specifically, the fundamental beliefs or principles within the church and what has transpired over the years within the denomination that has taken upon a name, but as we shall see just in a second, unfortunately, little by little substituted the definition of that name, substituted the foundation of eternal truth for something that isn't truth. So let us now examine the fundamental principles or the fundamental beliefs. Let us look at some of the things that have happened. David Gates focused on one particular such belief that has changed over the years. But before we get there, I want us to examine something else, something that is just as important and it will help us to actually be solidified in what David Gates mentioned. For those of us that are not familiar, the very first time that the fundamental beliefs or fundamental principles of the Seventh-day Adventist Church were presented to the world dates back to the year 1872. In the year 1872, the church presented 25 fundamental principles. A few years later, in the year 1889, these 25 fundamental principles were updated and three additional principles were added, which brings us to the complete set of 28 fundamental principles. These then principles, 28 fundamental principles, which Ellen White, as we saw from the previous statements, referred to as the foundation of eternal truth, something that God had given to the people, remain unchanged or updated throughout the entire ministry of Ellen White and the Pioneers. The very next official, though there were certain um, changes within the principles in the year 1931, the next official change of these principles takes place in the year 1980. They are then updated to a set of 27 fundamental beliefs. Now the word principle is exchanged for the word belief, so they're no longer called fundamental principles. They're now called fundamental beliefs. And then in the year 2005, 
an additional principle is added to that set of 27 fundamental beliefs. So what we're going to be doing now is just taking a quick look and comparing two sets or rather two particular points in these principles that have changed. And we're not going to go through all the principles, but we want to encourage you to do so. Not only continue to study what we are presenting here today, but also continue to examine some of the things that have been changed and ask yourself why. So we have the 1889 fundamental principles and the 2005 fundamental beliefs. Both these sets of beliefs have a total of 28 different points. We're going to start here with fundamental principle number 13 that is found in the original set of beliefs that were put out to the world during the time of Ellen White and the pioneers. And in that principle, we read that as the men of sin, the papacy has thought to change times and laws and has misled almost all Christendom in regard to the fourth commandment, we find a prophecy of a reform in the respect to be wrought among believers just before the coming of Christ. Does this fundamental principle sound familiar? Isn't that something that we also read in the Baptist Confession of Faith uh, that dates back to the year 1689? Isn't this principle connected to also not just the verses that were mentioned here at the end of this principle, uh, including the preaching of the three angels' messages, because this is the foundation of the third angel. It is also connected to what we read from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It is there, there was this falling away that took place, and God needed a reform to happen within Christianity. This is why we call it the Protestant Reformation. A reform began. We then learned that the Reformation was not brought to its completeness through these various denominations that were formed during these early years, and that God had to continue the Reformation in order for all truth to be revealed, and hence why we have the remnant, hence why we have the creation of the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. The main purpose of this denomination was to stand on truth, to complete the, ref the Reformation, and to expose the men of sin. And this is, and it is because their purpose through the preaching of the three angels' messages was to expose the men of sin. Rightfully so, this denomination has principle number 13 from their set of fundamental beliefs pointing to that men of sin. Now, the papacy was also indirectly mentioned within fundamental belief number 8 as well from the original 1880 nine fundamental principles there the man of sin is referred to as that power which is filled with different abominations why because this is the antichrist power this is babylon this is the man of sin this is that system that has been creating sinners out of people because it has substituted righteousness for sin we have two fundamental principles that specifically deal with the papal power, one of which specifically exposes this power as the man of sin. Well, let's now move to the current fundamental beliefs within the Seventh-day Adventist denomination, and let's do a comparison between these two principles. The, we're going to begin with the latter one, which is principle number eight, and that principle deals specifically with the millennium. So let's go on to the new set of fundamental beliefs and let's read about the let's read the same principle that deals with the millennium. The millennium is the thousand year reign of Christ with his saints in heaven between the first and second resurrection. During this time, the wicked dead will be judged and earth will be utterly desolate without living human inhabitants, but occupied by Satan and his angels at its close. Christ with his saints and the holy city will descend from heaven to earth. The unrighteous dead will then be resurrected and with Satan and his angels will surround the city. But fire from God will consume them and cleanse the earth. The universe will thus be freed from sin and sinners forever. Now, let's compare this one to the one that we just 
looked at from 1889. Do you notice a difference between the two principles? Is there something that is not found in this principle uh, as it was mentioned in the principle back in 1889? The answer is yes. There's absolutely no reference to the papal power in this newly updated fundamental belief. And one might argue, well, it does not need to be mentioned because the focus here is really the millennium. We're dealing with the millennium and we're going to succinctly put together this principle without the need of including the papal power and its abominations as part of that principle. And that might be a fair argument to make. However, let's ask now even the more important question. Let us compare fundamental principle number 13 from the original set of principles from the time of Ellen White and the pioneers to the same principle that is found today in the set of fundamental beliefs within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Well, unfortunately, we cannot do that. And we cannot do that, brothers and sisters, because that principle has completely been removed. Nowhere within the current set of fundamental beliefs is there a mentioning of the papal power. Nowhere within those principles is there a mentioning of the Antichrist as the man of sin. Nowhere within these principles do we see the papacy being exposed as the man of sin. Well, how can that be? Even the 1689 statement of belief from the Baptist denomination had included that. All the reformers continually talked about that. It was the purpose and goal in order for 2 Thessalonians to be completed. How can a denomination that has been called to preach the three angels' messages that has been called to complete refer the Reformation, eliminate as a belief, as a fundamental belief, the most important thing that they have been called to do to expose the papacy to the world and the apostasies that have happened in that church? What has happened? Unfortunately, brothers and sisters, what has happened is there has been a falling away. There has been deformation taking place within this denomination. Fundamental principle number 13 has been removed. And sadly, that is not all. And this is what now brings us back to the things that David Gates was presenting in his message. This is what people need to connect with all of this. How can an institution that claims to be the remnant and to be here to finish the work, to expose the men of sin to the world by preaching the three angels' messages, be lacking the very fundamental principle that was placed there by God because it is eternal truth from its set of beliefs. What has led to that? What has brought us to come to this place? What has caused this deformation, as we called it, to take place? Well, in order to do that, we need to look at a little bit more information that Ellen White has given us because she already prophesied that this was going to happen. So let's go back to her writings now and attempt to get more answers to the things that we are looking at today. She says just before her death, I am charged to tell our people that do not realize that the devil has device after device and he carries them out in ways that they do not expect. Satan's agencies will invent ways to make sinners out of saints. I tell you now that when I am laid to rest, great changes will take place. I do not know when I shall be taken and I desire to warn all against the devices of the devil. I want the people to know what I warned them fully before my death. Here we see a warning. She tells us there's going to be changes. Things are going to be changed because this is Satan's goal. And now in this next paragraph that comes from Testimonies for the Church containing letters to physicians and ministers, in the very chapter that is titled 
the foundation of our faith, we're going to get even more clarification as to this same very warning. There, Ellen White says, The enemy of souls has sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among Seventh-day Adventists. And this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith. She's making it crystal clear, brothers and sisters. There's no need for us to be confused with respect to what will be happening in the future. Initially, she told us, God's been the one who's been leading us point by point. He has placed us on a true foundation. This true foundation is the fundamental principles that he has given us. They are eternal truth. Now, here she tells us that these doctrines, these principles, are in fact going to be changed. They're going to be replaced. And it's going to be called further revelation, right? New light, or however else we want to consider that. But in fact, as we, have, as we shall see, it has not been new light. It has not been a continuation of reformation, but rather a deformation. Coming back to the statement, she says, would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith and engaging in the process of reorganization. Were this reformation to take place, what would result? The principles of truth, that these fundamental principles that she called eternal truth in many different places. She says the principles of truth that God in his wisdom has given to the remnant church would be discarded they're going to be removed <laughs> they're going to be changed they're going to be replaced our religion would be changed the fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as what as error a new organization would be established books of a new order would be written a system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced the founders of this system would go into the cities and do a wonderful work. The Sabbath, of course, would be lightly regarded as also the God who created it. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. And here's the key. We ask the question, why? Why has this happened? What is the primary reason as to why these things have transpired in the church? And she tells us here, I believe this is the strongest answer that we can receive to that question. She says, the leaders would teach that virtue is better than vice. And here's the key. But God being removed, they would place their dependence on human power, which without God is worthless. Their foundation would be built on sand, and storm and tempest would sweep away the structure. The final storm and tempest have not come yet. But then, brothers and sisters, it would be too late. The time is now for us to understand these things. This new organization, as she calls it, this new system would seem as if it is doing a great work. The numbers will be growing and growing. But she says when that true storm and tempest comes, when the final crisis hits this earth, we're going to see but a sweeping away of that structure alongside with all the members of that structure. But it will be too late then. We ought to understand it now. But coming back to the answer that we were seeking here to our question, she says that God will be removed. Not only will the principles be changed, but from among these changes that are going to transpire, there will be one major thing that will be the catalyst for all these things to happen. And she set points to the fact that God in this new system will be removed. In this warning here, in this chapter, the foundation of our faith, we see exactly what has transpired in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We see why David Gates was focused on the fact that the fundamental beliefs specifically that deal with who God is have been changed. Now, I don't know where David Gates stands on this issue. I don't know if he has completely understood what has transpired in, uh, in the church, in the Seventh-day Adventist movement. 
And this is the reason why we are doing this particular discussion today. We want to encourage him to continue to understand these things. So if you know him personally, please send this information to him. The more information we can get to people, the more they can see the things that have happened. I said in the beginning that oftentimes when a discussion breaks out, there's this desire for us or there's this possibility for us uh, to be subjective to our own opinion. But what we have been trying to do here today is stay away from opinion and focus on the facts. The facts, brothers and sisters, are clear and we can look at them with an objective point of view. Ellen White tells us what will happen. Ellen White tells us that we are not to allow this to happen. So when we examine the things that have transpired over the years, when we see that the fundamental principles of the church that were put together uh, throughout the time of Ellen White and the pioneers have been changed and removed, and when we see that she forewarned us about this, we have been given all that we need in order to come to the right conclusion. Now, in closing, let's just focus on this change that deals with God being removed. And there are many different uh, discussions that we have had upon this subject. We're not primarily dealing with this subject today. And we encourage you to go back to some of the previous, specifically Berean talks or remnant talks, as we have now changing the name, that deal with this one issue. Because it is the most important issue. And why is it the most important issue? Because that is what we see in the Old Testament. Every time Israel went into apostasy, one of the most important things or one of the biggest and and, and most prevalent sins that was found among them was idolatry. When idolatry took hold of the nation, uh, the Sabbath would go away. Various things would be brought in apostasy will continue to grow. But if you're to point out the number one sin of the Israelites in the Old Testament, by far it is idolatry. And all these lessons have been given to us as as examples. So we can learn from them. David Gates mentioned that there has been a change in the belief that deals specifically with the identity of who God is. When we go back to the 1889 principles, principle number one begins with this very information. In it, we see that there's one God, a personal spiritual being. And that this one God is everywhere present by his representative, the Holy Spirit. Fundamental principle number two then introduces another figure, another individual. And that is none else but the son of that one true God, Jesus Christ. And it says that there's one Lord, Jesus Christ the Son of the Eternal Father, and so on and so forth. And when we open the fundamental beliefs today, we see that a new belief has been introduced. God has literally been removed from the denomination. The denomination today no longer believes that there is one God, a personal being, and one Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Son of the Eternal Father the literal Son of the Eternal Father. But we find one of the vestiges of the Roman Catholic system that James Wise specifically talked about with respect to the Reformation failing. Remember what we read in the beginning from James White? Why did the Reformation did not was not able to finish the work, was not able to fully reveal the men of sin to the world because the reformers simply stopped reforming and here comes the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The initial Seventh-day Adventist movement that we are pointing to during the time of Ellen White and the pioneers. Today, when we open the fundamental beliefs of the church, we see that God has indeed been removed and in place of Him, the same unscriptural idea called the trinity that is found within babylon within all the apostate churches of protestantism is the deity that the seventh day adventist denomination ascribes to or worships god is no longer a personal being but rather he is now referred to as one god in three persons Jesus Christ is no longer the literal only begotten Son of God, 
but he's now part of that triune God. The Holy Spirit is no longer the omnipresence of the Father and the Son. They are representative, but the Holy Spirit now is presented as an individual being like the Father and the Son. God has been removed. Ellen White warned us. History testifies to that. We have not dealt with subjective opinions here today, but we have looked at the facts. And what God wants us to do in these last days, brothers and sisters, is to come back to the complete preaching of the three angels' messages. The only way we can come back to the complete preaching of the three angels' messages is if we, as a people, come back to the platform of eternal truth. It is only through truth that we're going to be sanctified and it's only through truth that we are going to be able to reveal the men of sin to the world. Living God. And thus we encourage you to continue studying upon these things. God has said that He will have a people. He will have a people that will indeed hold on to the things that He has given, to the things that He has revealed through His Holy Spirit. And it's only a matter of question whether you and I will be among them. And thus, we encourage you to not only continue studying these things, but ultimately we pray that one day soon you will be found standing on the platform of eternal truth. <music>